Welcome, everyone. Um, I think we've had time for folks to make their way here. So uh, I would like to introduce our interim vice chancellor for equity and inclusion, Dr. Marion Harris, who will be giving our welcome and introductions and things of the sort. Um, so I will pass the mic over to her. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Thank you, Dr. McCarthy. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to an evening with Dr. Fania Davis. This is one in a series of events uh, focused on restorative justice. I encourage you to sit back, to reflect, and to really think about um, what you will hear this evening. And at the end of the evening, I encourage you to be better, to do more, to demonstrate your commitment to restorative justice. At this time, I'd like to read the UW Tacoma Land Acknowledgement. The UW Tacoma community acknowledges that we learn, teach, work, and live on the ancestral land of the Coast Salish people in particular. Our campus is situated on the traditional lands of the Puyallup tribe of Indians. We recognize this is a difficult and painful history, and we understand we must play an active role in remembering not just what happened to indigenous communities post settlement, but also the rich history that existed long before colonization. This land acknowledgement is one small act in an ongoing process of honoring the past while working together with local tribes to build a more inclusive and thoughtful community. At this time, uh, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Jimmy McCarthy, who is the Executive Director for Equity and Inclusion and an affiliate instructor in the School of Education at the University of Washington, Tacoma. He is co-editor of The Business of War, Theological and Ethical Reflections on the Military Industrial Complex, which is the first in a book series, The Business of Modern Life, of which he is a general editor. Jimmy is a practitioner scholar of restorative and transformative justice in Tacoma and has published on these themes in journals of law and religious ethics. Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris. It is my honor today to introduce the moderator for our time together. Uh, the person who will be sitting in conversation with, asking questions of, uh, and uh, in dialogue with Dr. Uh, Davis is our very own Omari Amili. Uh, Omari is an author, speaker, and father of six from Seattle, Washington. Omari, Omari currently serves as the, as the Director of Technical Assistance for a juvenile justice nonprofit organization called Choose 180, uh, an organization I had the honor to work with a few years ago in a volunteer capacity that's doing amazing work uh, in King County. He's also a part-time lecturer in criminal justice at the University of Washington Tacoma, a school from which he earned two bachelor's and a master's degree after serving time in prison on 30 felony convictions for bank fraud. Uh, so Omari is a wonderful member of our community and it is my honor uh, to introduce him here uh, as he gets us started tonight. Thank you, Omari. Thank you, Jimmy, for the wonderful introduction. It's an honor to be here with you all today. You know, to be invited to be a part of this conversation you know, it feels really good to be acknowledged, you know, to have my presence valued. So uh, it feels great to be here today to join Dr. Davis in conversation. My role right now is to actually introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Fania Davis, who is a leading national voice in restorative justice. She's a longtime social justice activist, civil rights trial, trial attorney, a writer, a restorative justice practitioner, and an educator with a PhD in indigenous knowledge. You know, so I'm gonna go ahead. I'm not the star of the show today. So I, my job here was to introduce Dr. Fania Davis. So let me go ahead and pass it to her. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Omari. 
I want to ceremonially open with a traditional African Zulu greeting. Sawubona, translated from the Zulu is I see you. Beyond your physicality, beyond your body, beyond what I can perceive with these five senses, I see your spirit. I see your goodness. I see your humanity and the gift you are to the world. This kind of spiritual seeing is very important in our restorative justice work with young people in Oakland, young people who daily swim in a sea of racialized trauma. This kind of seeing can catalyze healing, demonize, criminalize, pathologize, marginalized, families crushed by mass incarceration and poverty, targeted for sexual abuse and trafficking, pushed through the school to prison pipeline, going to more funerals of their peers by the time the tender age of 18 uh, than us adults go through uh, during our entire lifespan. Many of these young people are not expected to graduate. But in the end, young people in our restorative justice schools not only graduated, but graduated with 3.0 plus GPAs. I'm a witness. When we create school cultures of connectivity through restorative justice peacemaking circles and other respectful, relational, and empathetic approaches, our precious children feel heard, they feel seen, they feel loved, they feel like they belong, and they thrive. This is the meaning of Sawabona. It is not just traumatized children of color who need these healing and loving spaces, these cultures of connectivity. The United States is a trauma nation. We were born into the blood of multiple traumas. Uh, that is our origin story. We all need compassionate, safe, trusting, vulnerable, healing spaces where we experience being witnessed in our truth and bearing witness to others' truths. We all need spaces where we see and are seen. That is how we begin to heal trauma. When practiced through a racial justice lens and in ways that honor its indigenous roots, restorative justice offers a methodology to co-create these spaces. And I know you circle people out in the audience. Uh, Dr. McCarty mentioned that there were some there uh, know what I'm talking about. Uh, Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh would call these spaces sanghas or spiritual communities. Dr. King and probably Reverend Lawson, who we were talking about earlier as well, would call them beloved communities. And Thich Nhat Hanh interestingly said, the first thing the Buddha did after his enlightenment under the Bodhi tree was to go out and create spiritual communities. And without that, he could not realize the dream of helping to end suffering uh, in the world. And Dr. King understood that this as well, 2,500 years later, when he focused on creating beloved communities. Thich Nhat Hanh also said, I believe the next Buddha will no longer be an individual. It will be a spiritual community, a Sangha, because one Buddha is no longer enough. We all must be Buddhas. Similarly, in our social justice movements, there will no longer be single, top-down, charismatic leaders as we had in my youth. That is not enough today. Our problems are so complex, we need everyone's wisdom. We need non-hierarchical approaches and non-vertical approaches. We need horizontal approaches to leadership. Uh, we need the leadership of the entire collective. 
We need radically democratic spaces where all voices are heard. We can't do healing or justice work on individual levels. It can only happen in community. And one of the main symptoms of trauma is fra being fractured, being disconnected, being isolated uh, from our bodies, you know, our spirits, uh, our families, our communities. So as a trauma nation, these kinds of spaces are so important uh, for both justice and healing. What might it look like to facilitate restorative justice circles and co-create these nurturing spaces, these relational and healing spaces right here at UW Tacoma, also in your communities, within your families, in our schools. And I understand there's some restorative justice work going on in schools. Um, so uh, thank you again. Thank you, Chancellor Sheila Edwards Lang, Interim Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion, Dr. Marion Harris, Executive Director for, of the Center for Equity and Inclusion, Dr. Jenny McCarty, a direct, Director of Faculty Engagement and Racial Equity Initiatives, Dr. Tanya Velasquez, um, Director of Office of Global Affairs, Dr. Jeff Cohen, and last but not least, um, our moderator, um, Omar Amili. Uh, thank you also to sponsors, uh, the School of Social Work and Criminal Justice and Office of Equity and Inclusion. Thank you for inviting me to be present, uh, to, to present rather, at the last session of the year of the Coalition Building for Racial Justice series. Today is an auspicious day. In 1986, the UN General Assembly declared December 2nd, the International Day for the Abolition of Slavery. Though this usually refers to contemporary forms of slavery and trafficking, it is appropriate to also include the afterlives of slavery, the living legacies of slavery in this commemoration of International Day for the Abolition of Slavery. Whether we're talking about racial police terror, mass incarceration, persistent racial inequities in all sectors of our lives and other legacies, living legacies of slavery. Let's reflect a bit on the word coalition. Its root word is coalesce, meaning to combine varied elements together to form one mass or whole. Like many puddles that coalesce into one stream, a single stream. Coalesce means to unify diverse elements. Um, I want to emphasize that one of the most important and powerful coalition building activities we can carry out today is co-creating these spaces where we can come together, feel a sense of interrelationality, a sense of oneness, a sense of interbeing, a sense of inter-identity. To students and young people in the room, thank you for being present. You or your loved ones may be facing COVID-related challenges. You or your loved ones may be experiencing financial hardship. You're at the end of the semester and may be experiencing stress, studying for exams or completing papers or projects. I just wanna say, I don't take it for granted that you're here this evening. Thank you for coming. I want to also honor and invoke the name of Manuel Ellis now an ancestor, crushed, punched, suffocated to death by four Tacoma police officers for no reason, for walking while black. I wanna honor his mother, Marsha Carter, uh, his siblings and other relatives. I wanna say, I am so sorry for your loss. So sorry this happened to your son and to you.
Thank you for the land acknowledgement, uh, Dr. Harris, um, honoring the indigenous inhabitants of the land now known as Tacoma, Washington. I wanna expand on that simply by adding that I live, work and play on the unceded territory of the Chochenyo Olun people in the land now known as Oakland, California. I speak in many universities and communities all over the country, and I see that more and more people are invoking the ancestors of the land and doing these land acknowledgements to open public gatherings. Let's take a moment to reflect on the significance of this development that is sweeping the nation. First, in indigenous cultures, the land does not belong to us. We belong to the land. She is our mother. She gives us life. She sustains us. She nurtures us. She nourishes us. And so it's heritage in ancient cultures to honor the land and give thanks to the land to open all community gatherings. November was Native American Heritage Month. Always, but during this season in particular, we pay tribute to the rich ancestry traditions and con contributions of the indigenous inhabitants of the land we now know as the United States of America. We can learn so much from the wisdom of the ancients, including the central teaching that when we plunder, pillage, and exploit our earth, we destroy ourselves, we destroy our children, we destroy life itself. We are having a lived experience, a nightmarish lived experience of this truth. I'm thinking of climate catastrophe. I'm thinking of the endless succession of heartbreaking images of floods, earthquakes, fires, extreme cold, superstorms, all manner of devastation on every continent that daily inundate the media. I'm thinking of the many, many souls across the globe, the globe that have been lost to climate catastrophe. I wanna just take a moment to do um, an embodied um, practice here. Um, so uh, please um, just make sure that you're comfortable and, and that your feet are on the floor, if that's possible. Find a comfortable position. And uh, if you're okay with that, uh, close your eyes as we go on this journey. Imagine, envision a world where we truly honor, protect, and hold sacred the earth, the waters, and the air. Imagine a world where the earth is alive, whole, unadulterated, fecund, teeming with life. Breathe and feel those sacred and fertile earth energies flowing easily through your body from toes all the way up the top of the head. Feel the aliveness in your body. Breathe into your lower belly, inhaling the deep aroma of the earth's freshness and fertility. Now imagine a world where our sweet waters and our fresh and our salt waters are clear and clean pristine, sparkling, and abounding with life and movement. Imbibe these holy waters now, allowing them to infuse and sanctify and illuminate every cell, every fiber of your body as they enter. Imagine a luminous world and vibrant world where we hold sacred, all the creatures that swim through the air, swim through the waters and fly through the air. Imagine a world where we live in harmony with all the plant people and the four-leggeds. Imagine a world where we truly hold sacred the ancestors, the elders, ourselves, our neighbors, the children, the ones to come, 
and all Mother Earth's inhabitants. You may open your eyes if you had them closed. Thank you. So these are indigenous worlds. These are ancient futures. I believe indigenous insights can light our way into a perilous future. I believe we darily need these indigenous medicines today. Back to the subject of land acknowledgements today at this historical juncture to honor the land and its original inhabitants is to acknowledge that just as with slavery and white supremacy and the slave trade, we have yet as a nation to fully recognize, take responsibility for, and take action to repair the harms of genocide, land theft, and their legacies. Because we have not faced and learned from history's pain, we keep reliving that pain. Although glimmers of change are dawning. Also, Today, to invoke the original inhabitants of North American lands is to acknowledge this is an occupied land, every acre, no less than the West Bank or Ukraine are occupied lands. It is to acknowledge ours is a post-genocidal land, no less than Rwanda or Germany are. The fact that in this country, the genocide and slavery happened four to 500 years ago instead of 30 to 80 years ago makes little difference. It is a distinction that makes no difference. You often hear people saying, oh, that happened long ago. You know, why are you still focused on that? You know, um, why are you stirring up the past? Just move on, just get over it. Just because these US Holocausts happened so long ago, doesn't mean it's no longer a live issue. Doesn't mean it's way back in our past, sequestered in our past. It doesn't mean it's a dead issue. On the contrary, having never acknowledged or reckoned with our birth traumas that are now more than 400 years old, makes it all the harder for us to heal. It is not true that time heals all things. On the contrary, this 400 year old unprocessed harm has now become so totalized, so normalized, so baked into reified in all our social structures, all our institutions, the popular culture, it has become so deeply embedded in the collective unconscious. Our government is in the habit of pointing the finger of blame at foreign countries who engage in massive human rights violation, terrorism, and genocide. But as an African proverb says, be careful when you point at someone else, when you point the finger of blame. Because if you look at your hands, you'll see that three fingers are pointing right back at you. Let's pause a brief moment to really uh, take in and to metabolize and ingest these complex, long buried, troubling, ugly, long silence truths, these repulsive and revolting truths about who we are as a nation. Unearthing the truth about harm, unsilencing these truths, facing these truths unflinchingly, disrupting collective denial about our collective biography are essential first steps on the road to new and just futures for the nation. The great American writer James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed if it is not faced. So we need to face or recognize history's pain. We need to take responsibility for it. We need to take action to repair it and take action to prevent recurrence. Those are the four R's of restorative justice accountability, whether on individual or collective levels. Indigenous peoples I talk to appreciate these land acknowledgements uh, that you did, that I did today and that are spreading across the nation. 
And they remind us that land acknowledgements are not reparations. Saying sorry is not the same as doing sorry. We know that very well uh, in the restorative justice world. And so uh, they, meaning the Chechen Ohlone people uh, here in Oakland where I live, they have asked non-Indigenous peoples and institutions that live and operate here in the Bay Area um, um, on their ancestral land to pay the Shu'umi land tax. I myself pay this tax on an annual basis. This is a form of reparations. It's a first step toward reparations. And I know that you are in conversation and dialogue with local tribes and perhaps you might, uh, if you haven't already, start discussing with them um, you know, what uh, you might do, you dub, as a way of doing sorry, as a way of uh, repairing, taking action to repair. You've muted yourself, Dr. Davis. I'm not sure where I left off, but I was talking about the Shuomi land tax and I was saying that this tax supports the rematriation and stewardship of the land. Uh, it is uh, supporting um, a, in, an indigenous land trust to restore ecosystems and creeks and wildlife corridors. Uh, it's also supporting the creation of gardens and ceremonial spaces and cemeteries to support the return and reinterment of sacred Ohlone artifacts and remains. So as I said, this tax is just one example, a very early one of how we can um, both do sorry and say sorry. Uh, today I'm um, talking of course about restorative justice and restorative justice is a healing justice. I make the case in my book, the little book of race and restorative justice that history is calling upon all of us to be purveyors of justice and peace, warriors and healers. I say warriors to connote power and wisdom, not aggression and militarism. Like the warrior sages, like fierce African Maasai warriors whose first concern is the well-being of the children. I say healer to connote healer of relationships, of communities, of the earth, and of present day collective trauma and historical and intergenerational trauma. This nation was born, as I said, in the blood of multiple traumas, colonialism, genocide, land theft, slavery, racial capitalism. And ever since we have become experts at harming our bodies, our spirits, our families, other people who appear different. Ours is a culture of harm. So whether you are a construction worker, a teacher, a prosecutor, a politician, a spiritual elder, or an entrepreneur, uh, we all uh, need to uh, begin to up-level our capacity to uh, engage with one another in the world in healing ways rather than in harmful ways. Restorative justice offers a worldview and a, a toolkit, a process to help us do this. Uh, let me bring home this idea of the historical imperative of becoming champions of both justice and healing by talking about my personal journey. But before I do that, can I uh, just do a time check? Can you tell me how long I've been speaking, Omari um, or Jimmy? We started it's seven o'clock, so we're about 30 minutes in. Okay, and, okay, and I think I started probably about 20 minutes ago. Okay, um, and why don't I get um, into my life's journey, uh, my journey toward uh, racial justice and restorative justice? Um, I was born in the 1940s, the late 1940s, in the most violent and segregated city of the South at the time, Birmingham, also known as 
Birmingham with all its bombings meant to terrorize uh, activists um, and individuals, uh, churches involved in the rising civil rights movement. Uh, my family lived atop Dynamite Hill. That was my neighborhood. So I was born in Birmingham and um, in the city of Birmingham. And I lived in the neighborhood of, of Dynamite Hill. That's my origin story. It was called Dynamite Hill because our family and other black families dared move into this previously all white neighborhood pushing the color line. Some of my and my siblings earliest childhood memories are being awakened in the wee hours of the night by dynamite blasts uh, vibrating our home and demolishing nearby homes. Remember our father grabbing his gun to join other fathers in the neighborhood uh, to protect their families from racial terrorists lurking nearby, nearby. Many people know about the September 15th, 1963 bombing uh, of the Sunday school. Um, there were many bombings, however. Um, I'll tell you about a couple of more. Um, attorney Shores, who worked with then NAACP attorney, attorney um, uh, Thurgood Marshall um, to bring down the walls of segregation in education and housing and employment and so on. His home was bombed four times. Uh, and it's just a miracle. Um, and we're so blessed that he was never harmed. His family was never harmed. Um, but he took to sitting out on his porch uh, with a shotgun uh, to protect uh, him and his family. And about the September 15th, 1963 bombing, I lost two close friends in that bombing, Carol Roberts and Cynthia Wesley, my playmates, um, my age mates, uh, family friends. And so the Bombingham experiences of racial apartheid and racial terror put me on a path as a warrior for justice. I subsequently became active in many, many movements civil rights, black power, black students, women's, anti-war, socialists, anti-imperialists, anti-apartheid, uh, Black Panther, prisoners movement, and others. When we moved from Alabama to California and began working with the Black Panthers, police broke into our San Diego home and shot and almost killed my husband. We were charged with attempted murder of police. The case was dismissed uh, when the court ruled that police broke into our homes uh, in violation of our First Amendment political association uh, right, that they targeted us solely because of our radical Black activism. And so uh, the charges were dropped, but they were, we were re-indicted two more times. The char charges were dropped by the same judge two more times and until finally we were freed of those charges. But within six months of this uh, near killing of my husband, the bullet entered his shoulder and exited just a millimeters away from his spine. Within six months of that incident, my sister was targeted uh, for, um, for mm, uh, execution in the gas chamber on capital charges of kid kidnapping and, and, and conspiracy um, and murder. Uh, solely because of her political activism. She was on the FBI's to most wanted list. I know there, must, there might be young people in the audience who don't know much about this case, but I suggest that you learn more about Angela Davis and there's a film called Free Angela Davis and All Political Prisoners. Uh, but you know, once she was charged and captured in 1970, I worked every day nonstop 24 seven for her freedom, traveled all over the world um, and um, organized and spoke to uh, build a movement massive enough and powerful enough uh, to free my sister to save her life. And indeed uh, in 1972, an all white jury acquitted her. The amazing lawyers on my civil rights, my sister's um, legal team rather, inspired me to become a civil rights trial lawyer. And so after almost three decades of 
fighting injustice in the courtrooms and in the streets as an activist, I felt burnt out. I was angry. I was filled with rage, rage against Birmingham and the experience of apartheid there, uh, rage against white supremacy, against racial terror, against the loss of my friends in the church bombing, against the shooting uh, near fatal of my husband, uh, against the attempted execution of my sister, against uh, the loss, um, um, rage against the loss of so many of my other friends. I literally got sick. Uh, I was um, burned out from the uh, hyper-rational, hyper-masculinist and aggressive energies that I had to cultivate or so I thought to be successful as a trial lawyer and activist. And I somehow knew intuitively I wouldn't get better until I bought more, brought more healing energies and spiritual energies into my life. So synchronicity and dreams led me to a PhD program that allowed me to study with healers in Africa. And when I turned from Africa, returned from Africa and finished my PhD in the early 2000s, I learned about restorative justice. It was a game changer, this new and old way of thinking about and doing justice. A justice that seeks not to punish, but to heal. A justice that is not about getting even, but about getting well. A justice that is a healing realm, not a battleground. A justice that creates social peace instead of deepening social conflict. Okay, so why don't we just take a break here, uh, oh, uh, Brother Omari, if, if, if that's okay. Um, and um, if you have any questions about the remarks I've made thus far, um, um, please you know, ask me. And I don't know if there are any questions in the chat yet, but I just wanna you know, pause for a moment and check in with you know the collective here. So I'm not speaking the whole time all by myself. For sure. For sure. Yeah, and I do have a question. You know, you, you had spoke on the fact that we need everyone's wisdom. You talked about horizontal approaches to leadership. You know, and I see a lot of box checking, you know, a lot of illusion of choice through limited options, you know, and even the word empower like implies hierarchy. There's somebody who actually empowers someone else. You know, mm -hmm. often you'll see youth who are brought in to answer questions, but they're not brought in to help develop the questions that are being asked and things of that nature. So I'm curious, what do horizontal approaches to leadership look like and how can we tap into the leadership of youth who don't quite recognize their value and haven't been in this position before? Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's an important question. Um, I, I think what I wanna do is tell a story about a circle um, that a couple of circles maybe, uh, but uh, one was when we brought our youth together uh, with the new mayor who had pledged that she wanted to have a hundred circles uh, with uh, youth, uh, with a hundred youth I think, or maybe just a hundred circles uh, during the first 100 days, that's what it was, of her um, uh, tenure as mayor. Yeah, so a hundred circles during the first 100 days uh, with youth in schools, including um, alternative schools and in the juvenile justice system. So we were excited about that and it, we, we did uh, organize uh, 100 circles and, and she attended. And um, in these circles, uh, invariably at the end, the young people would say, that was a good circle. Uh, because, you know, y'all listen to me, you heard me, you know, um, you didn't try to tell me what to do, but you truly uh, listened, and I felt heard, and I felt seen, and I felt that my voice mattered. Um, so when we get that kind of feedback from you, we know that we had uh, a successful circle, and that is that is um, an example of this horizontal leadership model, this profoundly democratic model where every voice matters. Those of you in the room who are uh, uh, circle keepers uh, know that um, every voice matters, that when you come into a circle, you leave your credentials out at the door. 
you know. And when you come into a circle, we cry, try our best to create a space where, uh, where young people's voices are just as important as mayor's voices or as police chief voices or as voices of people with positional power. And when they, at the end, when we do our appreciations, when they say that, uh, y'all heard me, you know, um, then we know we've done well. Now, on the other hand, we've had circles with uh, teachers, you know, who are new to restorative justice and just being trained in restorative justice and may get up and, and start, you know, lecturing and doing what they might do at a at a you know at, at the at the chalkboard in a classroom, kind of dominating, you know, standing up first of all, so you're towering over everybody else uh, when they're in the circle, and dominating uh, the, uh, the, uh, the whole circle with her voice. Uh, then that's not that's that would be hard, that would be vertical leadership. Yeah, that will be more hierarchical leadership. But as I said earlier, our problems are just so complex today. Uh, we need everyone's place, and the youth are experts, you know, uh, on these youth issues, and because um, uh, it's their lives. And I mean, there, there's there was a, a situation of bullying at a school, and uh, this school uh, spent hundreds, if not thousands, probably, yeah, thousands of dollars on shiny brochures and 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 you know, uh, uh, fancy uh, consultants. And it did not put a dent in the um, bullying. But a restorative justice practitioner came in and did a circle with the young people and asked the young people, what should we do? And they gave, they shared their wisdom in, in the circle and it was effective. It made a difference. It had a positive impact. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. You know, and I know that youth, you know, they're often due to their status as a youth, they're not really always allowed to be fully human, you know, like they're held to these unrealistic standards. Like, for example, adults can express anger towards youth and have very little consequence at times where youth, on the other hand, if they're in school, they express anger towards a teacher, there's going to be consequences and punishment that mm -hmm. comes along with that. Mm -hmm. So like what, what takes place in the circle that kind of levels that playing field? Um, what takes place is that we have um, a talking piece, uh, for one thing, uh, which is an equalizer. Uh, you can only speak if you're holding the talking piece and everyone's speaking, is uh, speaking from their heart and with respect, and everyone listening is listening uh, from their heart and with respect. So that does something, something sort of intangible happens in the circle. People feel deeply listened to. And when they feel deeply listened to, that draws out their uh, deepest truths even more. Um, we also have a, um, a facilitator whose job is not to run the circle, to manage it, and to you know, dominate the discussion. But the job of the, of the facilitator is to create a space where everyone feels comfortable. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, bearing witness, uh, speaking their truths, um, and even, you know, even when it's vulnerable. So basically the job of the facilitator is to, is, is, is not to run the circle, but to help the circle to run itself. And um, that helps. And then values. We create a container that can handle difficult conversation. Uh, uh, through some you know, collective setting of values and adhering to those values. And through ceremony, you know, we ground ourselves with meditation, um, you know, with uh, African drumming uh, to sort of land in the space and, and, uh, and you know, uh, feel, uh, feel uh, present you know, there. So um, yeah, these are the kinds of, of things that we do in restorative justice to create those healing spaces, those spaces where our youth feel seen, where they feel heard, where they feel a sense of belonging.
For sure. And I, I participated in the healing circle training, you know, and I never realized how sacred, you know, the process is, you know, the, the, the deep history of these circles. So I'm, I'm curious in your restorative justice work, like what's more important? Is it the process or the principles that guide the process? How important is the circle? Um, yeah, I would say that both are important. I think it's uh, non-binary. It's a both and rather than an either or. Uh, the principles and the process. Um, so we can have incredible principles, you know. Um, we can, you know, our principle may be to be loving. Our principle may be to uh, treat everyone equally. Our principle may be to not uh, respond to harm in ways that replicate and reproduce harm. Those are our principles. Uh, but, uh, you know, our processes may be punitive, they may be carceral, uh, we may um, uh, behave with people in ways that, you know, are not consistent with our principles. It's, you know, the whole thing about not walking the talk. So the talk would be the principles and, and the walk would be uh, the, the process. Um, so if we say that we want to elevate the voices of youth or elevate the voices of those most negatively impacted, center the voices of formerly incarcerated persons, for example, if we say that's what we aspire to do, but if we turn around and have a process that marginalizes those voices, uh, then of course that's problematic. Uh, so we want alignment of both principle and principles and process. So that's why I say they're inseparable. Uh, they, it's not an either or, not one is no more important than the other. Um, our, our practice or our process gets better, better when we reflect on our principles and our principles get better as we uh, reflect on our processes as well. Does that make sense? Um, and then I was talking in, um, uh, Professor Cohen's class a little bit earlier today, um, you know, ab about this question um, of process and principles. Um, we say we want to reimagine policing, you know, we say we want to uh, reimagine um, public health or education or whatever it is. And um, so our process needs to be consistent with that. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you say uh, use the restorative justice or truth and reconciliation process that is dominated by systems, uh, then you're only going to reproduce uh, those systemic injustices and that systemic racism. That's why I believe that even though historically a uh, truth and reconciliation processes like in South Africa and many other places are uh, led by government, initiated by government, managed by government, that we can't do that in this country. Uh, we need community oriented processes. Yes, we need the participation of government uh, but not the domination. Government needs to share power with communities. Uh, if we truly want to uh, disrupt systemic racism, we can't have the, a process that, um, that, that centers uh, systems. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, so how, how do we transfer power from policies and rule books and systems to the people in places where restorative justice might be a foreign concept? You know, if we're just introducing this concept, like how do you even begin the conversation? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's already begun in many ways, uh, you know, with our public discourse and with our action and our activism, it be began, um, it's been going on in this country for centuries probably, but more recently, the, the Black Lives Matter, um, those uh, movements uh, have, have, have started the, the process of, of you know, pressuring institutions to share power. Um, so it's, it's movements too. 
uh, you know, that's really what uh, will make a difference is organized uh, international movements like the movement, uh, international movement that saved my sister's life because they were literally trying to silence her by executing her. And we were afraid, you know, um, we, were, we were very, they spent thousands and thousands of dollars to concoct this uh, case against her. Um, but, you know, there were movements of people all over the world. Um, I mean, black people in this country, you go in their home during that time and you'd see a picture of Jesus Christ, of, um, of Martin Luther King and Angela Davis in living rooms. And there were uh, teachers for Angela Davis, firefighters for Angela Davis, doctors for Angela Davis, youth for Angela Davis. Um, these, you know, all uh, kinds of uh, committees formed all over the nation in large numbers. Um, and when I went to Europe and South America, the same thing, I spoke at rallies of tens of thousands um, for the freedom of Angela Davis. So it's movements that really, you know, bring about these changes, um, uh, or that at least open up uh, the possibility for um, uh, people who have been marginalized uh, um, and oppressed, you know, for their voices to be heard. I mean, like, you know, with, with the abolitionist movement, and, and especially in the last 20 or so years, the voices of formerly incarcerated people are now respected in a way uh, that never um, happened before, right? Just even, what, 15 years ago. Um, so it, it sees movements, uh, as I said earlier, um, that prepared the soil for that uh, uh, to bloom for this wonderful time when we are beginning to truly uh, listen to uh, persons who are most negatively impacted by the system of justice in this case. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I know like politics can play a big role. You know, you hear word, you know, phrases like defund the police in certain places. It's just like, it's going to turn people off, turn people against you and things like that because of their politics. And I know, look, there's brilliant people with huge hearts and enormous potential that have caused harm, right? And then, mm -hmm. but on the flip side, there's a lot of individuals in society that are like, oh, they're the scum of the earth. So with that being said, like, who is deserving of opportunities to participate in restorative processes? Are there any, is there anyone who should be excluded? Um, I think anyone who, and I'm talking about harmed or parties causing harm, responsible parties. I think any responsible party uh, who takes responsibility for what he or she, for the harm that he or she has done, who doesn't um, try to explain it away, who doesn't trivialize it, who doesn't minimize it, who doesn't try to make excuses for it, but someone who is truly, truly uh, remorseful um, and someone who's done a lot of soul searching um, and come out saying, you know, I really want to make this right. I want to do whatever I can, you know, to uh, make amends. I know I can't bring that person's life back, but, you know, I want to, uh, you know, I want to make sure this never happens again. I want to be a mentor and a role model for uh, young gang members, you know, so this will never happen again. So, you know, if that's a general principle, of course, in restorative justice processes, if the harm party does not acknowledge and fully and, and authentically acknowledge responsibility for hurting uh, someone, we're not going to let them into the circle only to cause harm again, only to, you know, re harm the harmed person. And what, so that means that, you know, if a person, maybe that means that I as facilitator need to sit down a little bit longer with the harm party and build my relationship, build trust with that person. Uh, and maybe they will come to take full responsibility and maybe we can uh, have the circle. Um, that's a, a critical um, principle though. Have you ever seen it, you know, where maybe the harmed party was not interested in the restorative process, but maybe a community or a school who, 
you know, is attached to this person, like the harm is often not felt by just an individual, but also mm -hmm. who they're connected to. If the harmed party is not interested, can a restorative process still take place? Yes. If the harmed party is not interested, we can have, did you say, did you say the harmed party is the harm? So, so the individual that the harm was done unto, if they're not interested in participating okay. Okay. in the restorative process. That's what I thought you said. Okay, yeah. so we can use surrogates. Um, we had um, the case of a young man uh, who uh, had, who was brilliant, you know, a brilliant entrepreneur and had created this computer theft ring uh, and um, he served some time in juvenile hall for it. And uh, when he was released, uh, we did a re-entry circle or a circle of support and accountability. Um, and um, we couldn't find the persons who had actually been harmed, uh, but we found a person whose computer was stolen and we brought her in and we did the process with her. So you can use surrogates. Um, and in this case, of course, she, she was a writer. So she, she told him that she lost like a, the, the manuscript of a book or something that she was writing and how, how you know, devastating that was for her personally. And, uh, and he got to hear that uh, face to face and experience empathy and, and experience uh, remorse and, and regret. And, and I think they talked about, well, what, what do I do? You know, recognizing the harm, taking responsibility for it and taking action to repair. Uh, they decided, uh, and of course he was a part of it too. It's not like somebody's telling him, you've got to do this to make it right, uh, to repair the harm. They, they collaboratively decide what he's going to do. And in that case, they decided, or she said she wanted him to uh, write uh, two articles uh, on uh, the subject of crime and computer theft. And he did that, yeah. So yeah, so he, yeah, there are ways of proceeding with restorative processes, even when the harm party. Uh, and the other, I have a cousin who's uh, uh, in San Quentin and uh, is in there because of, you know, of being in a gang uh, when he was very young. He's been in for like 35 years. He's barely 50 years old. And um, he um, went through some restorative justice processes. They're called victim offender education group processes um, uh, for um, uh, those inside, the, the guys, in, the men in blue, they call them. And that's an 18 month process where um, the men uh, talk about in circle, you know, they're, they talk about the harm that they cause, you know, without again, without, without trying to explain, without trying to justify it, without trying to minimize it, uh, just they really man up, you know, to what they have done. They talk about it in the presence of others. They are witnessed um and sharing their truth um and they do exercises for days where they you know you were talking about how the harm ripples out beyond the single individual our justice system doesn't recognize that but we know that the harm ripples out from the individual uh to the family to the community you know and maybe even to larger spaces um so he and they in this VOEG program, um, were required to contemplate, you know, for months and months, this rippling circle of harm that they set into motion. You know, spending like so much time contemplating that, talking about it, sharing it in circle. And then after exhaustively engaging in that process, they would spend the next six months uh, reflecting on the ways that they had been harmed, you know, because we always say harm people, harm people, you know, if they're, if they're traumatized and that trauma is not healed, then they will continue to um, cause harm, harm themselves acting uh, in or harming others acting out. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, I forgot what the original question was now. <laughs> 
Okay. You, you responded to it. Okay. So I, I have one more question for, we have a couple questions in the chat now. I wanna encourage the audience to please get those questions into the chat. I'm gonna ask one more question, then we'll move to audience Q and A. Um, when I think of restorative justice, you know, I, I often think of, okay, what we're trying to do, our goal here is restore things back to the way they were before the harm took place. However, in accomplishing that, you know, we recreate the conditions that allowed the harm to take place in the first place, right? So how can the restorative justice process play a role in transforming individuals and entities and systems to ensure no further harm is done? Like, what, what does transformative justice look like to you? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I hear this a lot. Um, in my view, um, this is restorative justice is transformative. It's not, it's not real restorative justice if it's not transformative. I was, I don't know if it was in the class before or I don't know if I've said this yet here in this room. Um, you know, there are three ways that we respond to harm and conflict, uh, that humans respond to harm and conflict. Number one, uh, we respond uh, with the first harm with another harm, the uh, retaliation-based way, the vengeance-based way, okay? Number two, uh, we avoid, we deny, uh, we um, push it under the rug. And number three, we lean into that conflict, lean into it so that we can learn as much as we can from it and see that harm, that mistake, as an opportunity to grow and become a better version of who you are. And our justice system does the first. It responds to the initial harm with another harm. Sure. But restorative justice does the third. It leans into the conflict so that we can learn and grow and not repeat that mistake. And there's the transformation. We learn, grow, transform ourselves so that this will never happen again. So I don't, I don't think we have a restorative justice, a true restorative justice process, if it's not transformative. And uh, of course, you know, as a person who is, has been involved in transformative movements all her life from the time that she was a child, I could never be involved in uh, something that uh, is not also transformative. And let me also say this, Omari. Uh, that is not to say that transformative justice and restorative justice are identical. Uh, there are some differences. Uh, number one, a transformative justice doesn't work within systems. They work in communities only. It's a pure, I mean, I don't mean to be, you know, denigrating, but it's, it's kind of a purist uh, approach. I think it's important for to us to work in both systems and outside systems. I mean, I love the idea of, of creating community-driven, community-led uh, uh, ways of, of responding to harm so we don't have to go to the police, you know. I like that idea of focusing on the community capacity, building the community capacity uh, to uh, respond to harm and wrongdoing in our communities with our youth and with others. I love that. And that's part of what transformative justice does. Uh, we do that too in restorative justice. And we also work in prisons, like you know the program, the restorative justice program that my, uh, my cousin who has just grown amazingly uh, 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 and transformed amazingly, uh, in large part from that restorative justice program that I just um, described to you, uh, where they spend, you know, and I forgot to say this, and this was actually your question. So after spending months and months contemplating the rippling harm that they caused, and contemplating months and months all the ways that they have been traumatized and how that led them to traumatize and harm others. The process, the, it's an 18 month process culminates in a circle uh, with persons who have been similarly harmed, not their matched victims, but people say, if my um, cousin killed someone, you know, then the family of that person would not be in that circle, but other families who have had similar losses would be present. 
or using that surrogate process. Yeah, and that, that, was, that was really the question that I was trying to answer. I got a little sidetracked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so transformative justice um, and restorative justice are not that different to me, except that you know we uh, in restorative justice work in prisons, we work in schools, we work in, 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 in systems, systems of domination. We are there, you know? And of course, there are some risks uh, you know, being in these punitive, uh, hierarchical, uh, sometimes abusive systems, and there's risks of co-optation and all of that. But and that's why the transformative justice uh, practitioners usually avoid those those uh, places. Uh, but one final thing on, on that question on transformative justice and restorative justice, I can see why people have bad mouthed uh, restorative justice, and you know have given restorative justice a bad rep, I should say. I, I don't want to say bad enough, but given it a bad rep. Because you hear this all the time. Uh, you know, we don't want to go back, you know, to the anti-status quo. Uh, you know, we want to go forward. And restorative justice is a, for, is a forward-looking justice. It seeks to stop uh, a recurrence, prevent recurrence of the harm. It's... it's um, and then the, the final thing I want to say about restorative justice and, and, and transformative justice is this. I can see why people got those, those ideas, those negative ideas about restorative justice. Um, that's because when it started in uh, the mid 1970s in this country, all white movement, you know, Mennonites, um, and had no racial justice or social justice consciousness, uh, which is kind of shocking considering that it is people of color who bear the brunt of the inequities of the criminal justice system. And so for an organization that purports to transform justice in this country, not to have any consciousness um, about, you know, uh, about racial justice, uh, is, 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 is pretty mind-boggling on the one hand. On the other hand, we live in a world of white supremacy, a world born in slavery, um, and a world where we have not uh, acknowledged those traumas of our beginnings. And, and so, you know, um, we abolish slavery, uh, but the racial terror at the heart of slavery it lives on in convict leasing and we abolish convict leasing and that lives on in gang, chain gangs and abolish chain and that lives on in lynching. Abolish lynching, that lives on in Jim Crow. And then, you know, you abolish Jim Crow, that lives on and the terror lives on in police killings and in the uh, school to prison pipeline. So we're in this, we are caught. We are only, we, 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 we are not, we're caught in the past, in our past. We are hostages of time and prisoners of time. We cannot even create new futures because we are, all we are doing is reproducing the past in different guises, but same essence. Um, yeah, so anyway, so what I was saying is that the restorative justice movement uh, is going to be contaminated, of course, in, uh, and affected by uh, white supremacy, uh, systemic racism, all of our institutions are. It is so totalizing and so ubiquitous, uh, in part because we've shoved it under the rug and so it's deeply embedded in our collective unconscious. Um, however, the good news is that once more Black people started getting involved in restorative justice and leading restorative justice organizations, especially in urban areas around the country, I'd say the last 10 years, uh, that has changed. We see more articles on the subject. We see more conferences on the subject. Uh, we see more leadership, formerly incarcerated Black men, for example, and these leadership of restorative justice movements. Uh, but I can see that given our history, the restorative justice movement history, that people would see restorative justice as something that is kind of regressive, you know, um, and, and uh, instead of progressive and um, and wants to go backward instead of forward. 
sure. And I'll say all it takes is to have a conversation with someone who's participated in these processes and the evidence of their personal transformation is going to be there just from that conversation, right? Totally. So, totally. Thank you for that. Um, let, let's go ahead and move to these audience questions. Mm -hmm. And can, can I make sure that I have just a few minutes to, to be able to close? Uh, I have just a few closing remarks. I definitely want to hear the audience and let's hope we still have time. We've got 20 minutes, it looks like, right? Okay, so I think we have about 10 more minutes, oh, 10 minutes. before we oh. pass it to the Dean of oh, the School of Social right. Work and Criminal Justice. So maybe we'll take two questions and then okay. you can give your call. Yeah, okay, I'll try not to give such long-winded answers. <laughs> okay. So we might have time for a third one, depending on you know how, how succinct the answer is. So you mentioned <laughs> here, there's no name attached to this, by the way. Good morning. Yes. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm happy to also pass it back to Dr. Davis uh, after my closing remarks. Okay, so we can utilize this full 10 minutes then for audience Q&A. Okay, yes. got it. Appreciate that. Okay, so the first question that we have, and there's no name attached to it, so it's, it's anonymous. Um, you mentioned healing with justice early in the session. That isn't something I've heard of before and don't really think about going together. Can you say more about how you understand the connection between healing and justice? Well, that's a, that's a profound question. Let's see if I can be short. <laughs> um, yeah, I used to think that they were opposites too. Um, and it was strange because I would feel that I'd be drawn toward meditation and and healing um, on the one hand. And, you know, as a revolutionary, uh, you know, it, I felt that was something altogether different. Um, and certainly none of my colleagues or comrades in, in the Black Power movements and in the socialist movements and the revolutionary movements that I grew up in, uh, they were not thinking about healing and would never utter the word or even love. Maybe they'll talk about revolutionary love. Um, but I, I remember I used to hide my meditation and yoga from uh, many of my comrades because I, I thought they would consider me soft or you know not a real hard revolutionary. Um, yeah, so yeah, I definitely thought that they were separate back then. Um, and it was restorative justice that helped me to bring the two together, um, you know, bring the inner warrior together with the inner healer in me. And it helped me uh, uh, move into greater wholeness uh, as a person. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why restorative justice was something that resonated so powerfully for me. Um, because restorative justice is a healing justice. Uh, and I could go on and on about this, but let me just say maybe two more things. Um, so... I was when I was in uh, Professor Cohen's class a little bit earlier, a student uh, gave a very good uh, description of why we have to, we can't have justice without healing, we can't have healing without justice. Um, and if I had that chat, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd quote it, that quote, I'd quote it to you right now. But I, I think the idea is that. Um, we can't have justice if we don't also heal ourselves. Uh, when one is traumatized, as we are, this is a trauma nation, uh, um, uh, you know, we constantly act out if we have not healed that harm, hurting other people or act in hurting ourselves. So, you know, we can of uh, maybe, you know, have a law that says we, you know, black people can't be killed by police anymore. But until we do that trauma healing work, uh, both sides, it's going to keep on happening, you know. Um, and any, in, in other words, any justice, any justice victories will be ephemeral. They will not be sustainable. Uh, because our uh, bottom line is to harm, you know, that's our default. Um, and, um, and so we can't have 
justice until we have healing. And we can't have healing until we have justice because we are, if you look around, you know, our world is saturated in harm and understandably so, because that's what we were born in. We were born in this massive uh, um, harm, this unfathomable harm. Uh, our culture is a monument to harm. Um, and that harm is going to continue um, and, and express itself in, itself in, in, in justice uh, until we heal. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I just don't see how we can have one uh, without the other. You know, healers need to also be justice warriors because you can't, you know, you can't really create healing if you don't transform uh, this massive culture of healing. You know, um, if, if you're interested in healing, you don't just uh, care tenderly for the plant, the individual plant in the garden. You know, yes, you do water it, you know, yes, you do fertilize it. Yes, you do take care of it, but you can't stop there. You've got to heal the entire ecosystem uh, in which this plant is growing. So you can't heal a single person without healing the entire ecosystem of harm uh, that we have been born into and that we still live in. Um, yeah, so I think that's enough on that. I appreciate that. So a question from Naomi, what do you think would be a good start to implementing a horizontal leadership model for our current correctional system? Um, for the correctional system, well, I wouldn't start there necessarily, but I mean, you know, I'm looking at, because we got us, when we start something new, uh, we don't want to start with the hardest, uh, you know, uh, fact uh, uh, situation, the, hard, the hardest um, site. I mean, I'm looking at um, what I'm saying is that, you know, let's start maybe with cooperatives uh, in workplaces, you know, uh, where you don't have a CEO. You don't have a, a you know, a suite of, 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 um, of executives. You have everybody on the same level. You have a circle of owners and their voices are, are equally important and equally decisive. Um, all of them are leaders of the company. They own, all of them are owners of the company. And I'm seeing some really exciting uh, work in restorative economics and cooperative economics that uh, where they're developing those uh, uh, <clears throat> horizontal leadership models. Um, and yeah, so that, I, I think I will stop there. And well, maybe I'll just say one other thing. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is another example. I don't know to what extent they've, they've actually been able to um, live into these, these models, but they have certainly talked about them. I mean, of course, that raises the question of principle and, and process. But I remember um, with Ferguson, um, when the press was complaining, um, y'all don't have any leaders in your movement. We can't find, we need a spokesperson we can talk to. And so the young women uh, responded, um, well, they said, well, the, cop, the, the, the uh, press said, you have a leaderless movement. That's important, I missed that. You have a leaderless movement. You know, we, don't, we can't identify any leaders. And the young women, and these were women and mostly queer women, uh, responded, on the contrary, we have a leader full movement. And then she rattled off a long, long list of names, you know, uh, which uh, suggested to me that this notion of uh, collective leadership, uh, of a radically democratic leadership uh, was certainly being talked about, if not, uh, actually, pra well, I would say practice, really, um, in the Black Lives Matter movement, contrary to the movements of my time, when we had, you know, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Rap Brown and I could go on and on, the, uh, the single, the solitary, uh, often male, straight, uh, cisgender leader. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm.
So one last audience question. Um, who was recommended in addition to the harmed and the person who caused harm to participate in a restorative justice process? And at what point during the process is the healing circle most beneficial? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I understand that, that question, but I, I'll, I'll answer it to the best of my ability. Um, well, we talked about how harm never impacts just a single, a sole, uh, solitary individual, even though our extremely individualistic culture would have us believe that. Uh, and that's how it's dealt with, certainly, in the uh, criminal justice system. There's one defendant, usually, um, in criminal cases. Um, but, or one, one sorry, one um, victim. Um, in restorative justice, we, we see that harm can impact um, a broader circle of, of, of people than just that individual who's harmed. First of all, their family, and, and then you know, their extended family, and their communities, maybe their church members. Uh, so in these restorative justice circles, we try to get, we don't want to have them too big because they become unwieldy. But say if a young person, say, um, say a young person has, uh, I don't know, vandalized a temple, uh, a Jewish temple, you know, with Nazi um, um, insignia and stuff like that. Uh, we would want uh, some members of the uh, temple there, of the congregation there. We probably want the rabbi there, the leader of the church. Uh, um, we might want uh, someone from a local, you know, Jewish organization there. Um, and on the side of the young man who caused the harm, uh, his family members, his caretakers, um, and maybe even a person in the community who has heard about this and feels frightened by it. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the beauty of circles. There are different models in restorative justice and the circle is the most broad, allowing for the largest and the broadest participation. We can do victim offender. I don't like to use that language, victim offender. It's too, you know, it's so binary. And uh, we know in fact that if you scratch the surface, every person who, is, uh, who has harmed someone has been harmed themselves. Um, and, and often persons who have been hurt have hurt others as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty much what I'd say about that. Mm -hmm. All right, well, it's been an honor to engage in this discussion with you. You know, I really appreciate you. We're gonna go ahead and pass it to Dr. Kiva Miller, who is the Dean of the School of Social Work and Criminal Justice at University of Washington, Tacoma. And after that, we'll come back to Dr. Fania Davis for her closing remarks. Okay. Thank you, Amari. Dr. Davis, thank you for providing the gift of your wisdom and for sharing your, your own trauma history, experiences of injustices and violence perpetrated against you and your family and how you came to this critical revolutionary work. I truly appreciate the voice for which you speak, your acknowledgement of our histories, our present realities, and the visioning for a different and more just society. Your presence in this forum and the strong message has served as an important reminder how each of us within our respective roles within the university has the responsibility of promoting restorative justice and healing spaces. As a community, I'm reminded how Dr. Davis's message directly translates to the work we are called to do within our UWT community, a community that in reality is a system of higher education that by nature is embedded in white supremacy. Still, our community is called to transform as we center equity, inclusion, and social justice. There are so many takeaways from this evening from Dr. Davis's talk. But I have a, a, a few key takeaways or, or calls to action. Um, when we seek and promote restorative justice for communities of individuals locally, regionally, nationally, it's important to create spaces for healing and it requires that we all participate 
and these nurturing and healing spaces, regardless of our positionality. The word coalition, I loved the way you broke down coalition. I particularly appreciate the way you broke the term down and that, co uh, that we coalesce to create an alternative truth by disrupting injustice, oppressive institutions and intergenerational trauma by being champions of justice and peace. And that every voice matters that when we come together with the same purpose in the pursuit of justice, we leave our titles at the door. We need to honor um, the experiences and contributions each um, bring within the circle. I appreciate the concept of the circle allowing people being heard and honored when a space is created for all to speak their truths. Um, when we allow multiple perspectives and voices and spaces, we create a process for restorative and, and healing work. And finally, I'm, like I said, there's so much. <laughs> you, you provided so many gifts for us this evening. But I, I'm, I'm going to close and then pass it back to you. But I ask that the UWT community really look at how our principles um, are strengthened by our processes and our processes are strengthened by our principles. Mm -hmm. um, that, that really hit home for me. And so thank you. Um, again, I, I think it's important for you to be able to, um, to end the evening. So I am going to pass it to you, Dr. Davis. And again, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. That was a beautiful and, and amazingly succinct uh, a summary of all of my comments. And so thank you for hearing me. Um, I want to end with uh, uh, two quotes. Um, the first from Dr. King. Uh, Power without love is reckless and abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. I'll read that last sentence again. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love, Dr. Martin Luther King. And my final quote is, uh, just, I'm sorry, don't just have hope. It's not enough to simply have hope. We must be hope. So with that, I, I, I say thank you for hearing me out and thank you for our time together this evening in community. Um, and an intercommunion with one another. Um, I appreciate all of you and, and, um, and uh, may you continue your blessed work, uh, the work of, of justice, and the work of love. Thank you. Mm -hmm.